I am Marcia Saxton. I work at the World Institute on Disability, housed here at the Ed Roberts campus. And I'm also a lecturer at Disability Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. And this is my colleague. Hi, I'm Alex Guinness. Uh, I'm also from uh, the World Institute on Disability, and I'm a policy and research specialist over at WID. Uh, about three years ago, I started writing on the intersection of climate change and disability. It was something that was very interesting to me because throughout my time in college and then working in renewable energy, I realized that we are kind of in a, in a, in a new frontier in terms of where we're at with climate change and the wor where the world is going, and that people with disabilities are in a unique situation where any time that we enter a new frontier or something that's unstable, that we, uh, uh, we have a unique position there. So we've been working on that and then writing a bit about it and now uh, educating the public and really appreciate you all coming here and hope you have a, uh, enjoy the workshop. So, and this is Linda Helland, who we are very gracious for supporting us uh, throughout this event. Thanks, Alex. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Linda Helland. I'm the team lead for the Climate Change and Health Equity Program at the California Department of Public Health. And uh, our mission at the Office of Health Equity is to promote equitable social, economic, and environmental conditions to achieve optimal health, mental health, and well-being for all. And health inequities are systemic, avoidable disparities in health status that are systemic and unfair. And people with disabilities, uh, more than one in 10 of us who have disabilities, um, face health inequities because of a systemic uh, inequitable distribution of power and resources that lead to things like a higher poverty level among people with disabilities, which in itself is a risk factor for health harm from climate change. And then um, it also, that systemic uh, injustice also leads to worsened living conditions, which then increase people with disabilities' risk for things like heat illness or um, injury, illness, and death from climate-related extreme events, and this is all unjust. So in my work, I'm seeing more and more how people facing injustice, including people with disabilities, uh, are actually more resilient and less shocked um, when adversity strikes, uh, because their whole lives they've had to develop the skills and networks and capacities and um, resilience to be able to deal with adversity. Uh, and it's those kind of skills that I want us to, that I want to learn from, that I want us to spread throughout our climate justice movement in California. Um, even as we develop systems and policies that shift more resources to people facing injustice, resources such as jobs, facilities, cash, levels of service, and power, decision-making power in our society. In public health, we often talk about the curb cut effect, which means that um, when we build our sidewalks with uh, curb cut so that people in wheelchairs or walkers can use it more easily, it makes it better for all of us. So kids pulling wagons and parents pushing strollers and people on bicycles and seniors, we, we all benefit from it. And people with disabilities were of course at the forefront of demanding that policy and system change from which we all benefit. I also see people with disabilities leading the movement to preserve healthcare for all of us at a national level. And, um, and this workshop uh, is an example of the leadership of people with disabilities at, um, forging the way for all of us to be more resilient to the health impacts of climate change. What we will be talking about today, it's going to be kind of split into three parts. An introduction to climate change itself, and then kind of a higher view of what are the connections between climate change and disability. And this, there are connections on all sorts of levels, and hopefully this will kind of light up light bulbs uh, as we speak when, uh, when people are 
understanding and conceptualizing these connections. And then the last part is going to be talking about what can we do going forward for our community to protect our community. So first, just mentioning uh, what I say as what are the two broad connections between disability activism and climate activism. So disability activism is activism for a good life. Uh, is that people with disabilities, we need support for health and independence. Uh, a lot of people here are people with disabilities or disability activists. Um, understand that uh, those pieces of supports include medical supports such as quality health care, medical equipment, medical supplies, uh, actual medication, um, also life quality resources, uh, personal care assistance, uh, um, accessible housing for those of us with mobility needs, uh, uh, transportation, and when we talk about transportation, that can be accessible vehicles or it can be accessible public transportation, physically and financially accessible public transportation, jobs in terms of uh, employment, and then also uh, uh, availability of jobs that work for people with disabilities and a lack of discrimination. Uh, we need funding and stability for all of these things. All right, so the next slide is about climate activism. And climate activism covers kind of a second step of this entire situation that we're in. And when I say climate activism is for survival, we say climate change is a matter of global survival. Uh, we're talking about disability activism being about survival for people with disabilities getting the supplies that we need, the medical care that we need, constantly fighting for it, that climate change uh, is right there on that same point. Just like disability, many things are affected. We've got food production, uh, natural disasters, public health. Um, a lot of people don't really recognize uh, migration as an issue there, but if you've heard about uh, rising seas and say what's going on in Miami or some of the smaller island states, people will need to figure out where they are moving in those situations. Uh, so there's a lot uh, that's connected to this issue. And then that, uh, and this is what we really care about, and this is what comes into climate justice and the climate justice movement, is that some people are more impacted than others. And those people include uh, um, uh, the poor, uh, just minorities of any kind, uh, people in developing countries, uh, who, for the most part, contributed far fewer emissions as countries and per capita uh, than the developing countries uh, or developed countries, and uh, people with disabilities also, and a range of disabilities also. Uh, so uh, some groups are denying that climate change exists, and far too many of those people are in positions of power, which is frightening. Uh, and uh, then fighting to stop any sort of action to even recognize that it exists or move toward reducing emissions or addressing any level of it. And many others are fighting to cut emissions uh, and move towards renewables and things, but they're ignoring how we need to adapt and prepare. What exactly is climate change? And I'm gonna get a little bit scientific here for a second, but I think it's important to understand what this is, where it comes from and also how it's going to keep moving forward. Uh, really, even if we go 100% renewable today. So climate change is that thermal radiation or warmth comes down from the sun and uh, makes the earth warm. Uh, certain greenhouse gases trap that radiation and keep the atmosphere warm. They keep the uh, energy from going and bouncing back into space. They keep warmth here in our atmosphere and keep us from being freezing. Uh, we emit carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases uh, by burning fossil fuels, uh, cutting down forests or having forest fires. Also, when you cut down forests, then you remove the plants that could pull CO2 out of the air and turn it into plant matter itself. Um, and then as we're pumping out those greenhouse gases, they basically make the blanket of the existing atmosphere that much thicker and then that much warmer. Uh, so that warms up the atmosphere, 
And that leads to global warming, which was kind of the original phrase that everybody coined, was not this is climate change, but this is global warming. Um, and then that changes weather and other aspects of the climate. It leads to stronger storms. It leads to deeper droughts. There's one more bullet point at the end of that, isn't there? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, other aspects of the climate. Uh, I was talking earlier about soil moisture, where uh, if you have a warmer atmosphere, it pulls water up out of the soil and dries it out. Uh, and then, you know, you might have a drought where it's not raining, but then even it's pulling water up and out of the soil, uh, and then you get plenty of other issues. And then if you have a really rainy year, then you get all the mudslides like we had this past year. Uh, all of these things flow and, and, and work together, and this affects nature, ecosystems, and eventually humanity. Uh, and we care about nature and the ecosystems, but it's going to affect us. It's not just you know polar bears and coral reefs. And about climate change, what we have here is that climate change leads to impacts and it leads to indirect impacts. So the direct impacts are kind of the weather things, which are uh, stronger and more frequent storms, uh, expanding droughts and forest fires, uh, rising sea levels, uh, uh, ocean acidification, more intense heat waves, general weather and pattern changes, and then those impact uh, environments and humanity in Things like infrastructure damage, uh, the very strong storms hurt Oroville Dam uh, recently, and then the Oroville Dam damage left to almost uh, 200,000 people being evacuated from their homes. A giant mudslide knocked out Highway 1 that's still being dealt with right now. Um, food insecurity, if there's crop damages, uh, poor health and mortality, which uh, Department of Public Health talks about in great detail. Um, economic disruptions from all of these different things. Uh, uh, ecosystem or other kind of instabilities. And then widespread migration around climate refugees. Uh, there's a lot of America that's close to sea level. Um, and we're looking at uh, rising oceans moving forward. So these are things where you know areas are vulnerable. Al Gore has been an amazing champion in raising awareness about climate change and of carbon that you put out into the atmosphere. It's a very different way of framing things. Um, so when people sit, talk about stopping climate change, they're talking about international targets. Uh, the current ones say, you know, we're at that one degree centigrade level. They say keep it below uh, two degrees centigrade and ideally 1.5. These are just kind of, you know, they're numbers. They're good numbers. Uh, it doesn't quite say, listen, climate change is a gradual growth. It's just kind of a target. Um, but adaptation, and this is where uh, um, it's important, is it's vital. It's so far been neglected, but I hope that all of us, and especially with uh, Governor Brown's executive order, uh, can start focusing on adaptation. Cities are developing adaptation plans. Uh, in a lot of the world, countries are developing adaptation plans. Communities are calling for climate justice and adaptation plans. And our community can be a part of adaptation advocacy and adaptation planning. What is adaptation? Adaptation is preparing for climate change itself. It's very important. It saves lives. It saves well-being. It can keep economies in order. And let's remember about that disability activism that I talked about on the first place, that a stable economy and a stable society is really important for disability livelihood and disability rights. Uh, so um, uh, the step one is to create general resiliency. There's this organization that's uh, founded as a part of the Feller Foundation, and it's called 100 Resilient Cities. And these are 100 cities nationwide that have contributed to uh, having a resiliency plan that doesn't even necessarily have to hit climate change. Many of them and most of them do, but to become more resilient to any sort of shocks. Oakland and San Francisco are two of those. Uh, these are local, they're all around us, and, and they really care. Uh, then, uh, um, so that's physical and economic infrastructure. That's
social systems and support networks for people with disabilities and everybody else that's around. Step two is uh, situation focus planning. If, um, uh, if somebody is in a county that is susceptible to wildfires, then doing uh, really strong wildfire planning. If somebody is in, or if an area is uh, uh, an area susceptible to sea level rise, um, then figuring out how to either build better seawalls or even doing plan, manage, repeat, or retreat, uh, uh, better resource management uh, around water and drought, and then, uh, uh, well, the migration piece, internal and also international migration around planning and around international agreements and partnerships. Um, and it's important, just as with any other type of activism, to start early, provide resources, and plan ahead. Uh, some examples for stronger storms, you can get uh, better disaster readiness and recovery. Uh, there is a very powerful partnership here in California looking at DRR, that disaster readiness and recovery, specifically for people with disabilities. Uh, Marsha and I were at a, a Getting It Right uh, conference and event, and there were easily 100 people uh, at that event uh, uh, just one day in Sacramento. And, oh, sorry, 200. yeah, 200, there we go, um, 200 uh, at that day in Sacramento, and it was powerful. Um, it was powerful, people told stories and how much they care and what they want to do. Um, so uh, resilient infrastructure, individual and community actions uh, in order to prepare oneself and do outreach and education, for example, to the disability community to do that individual preparation for more extreme weather. Drought water shortage and crop stress, uh, and um, uh, drought resilient uh, crop choices, wise water management, uh, large, with large scale migration, then uh, managing services, transit, and support if people want to move, and say doing proactive movement, and then international agreements with a human rights focus. And the final thing here before passing it off is to do all this within the frame of adaptive climate justice, which is that oppressed and marginalized groups. This is under the greater idea of social justice in general, right? Is that social justice, you recognize that there are some groups that are historically marginalized and oppressed, and currently marginalized and oppressed. And you fight for equal rights, and you fight for the resources that are needed for those equal rights. And with climate justice, we have to recognize that, in general, uh, uh, oppressed and marginalized groups will be hit the hardest and supported least, um, and the less, less able to adapt on their own. Uh, uh, somebody who is incredibly wealthy can uh, probably take a private jet to, uh, you know, to, to a new mansion in a place that isn't flooded on the coast, uh, but somebody who doesn't have those resources might not be able to. And uh, the, the oppressed communities are developing countries and the global south, economically disempowered and poor individuals, people of color and religious or ethnic minorities, and people with disabilities. Uh, and then adaptive climate justice will address the root causes of vulnerability uh, in general so that people can be more prepared, uh, and then prepare with specific focuses on those vulnerable groups and provide the resources and demand help from the privileged uh, in, order to, uh, in order to have those benefits. I'm gonna talk more about disability and climate change from the perspective of the disability community and disability studies. So as we've said before, people with disabilities need supports and we need to advocate for ourselves to have the good lives that we expect to have. Um, we need, as we said, medical care, um, durable medical equipment, we need supplies, medication, we need personal assistance, housing, accessible housing, accessible transportation, we need jobs, we need supports to be able to find jobs and keep jobs with accommodations. Um, we need things to be stable for the resources to enable our lives to work and to be, to be good and have great lives that we deserve to have. 
And this takes time and energy. And all of us who have looked for work despite disability discrimination know that it's an enormous amount of effort to push through the disability discriminatory attitudes and the barriers in the culture as well as handle the physical whatever aspects of having the impairments that we do. And it's fragile and vulnerable and those words are important in this context. And we see that there's an analogous situation with climate activism, um, that it's a matter of global survival for everyone. And the impact is happening now. <clears throat> Food production, natural disasters, and so on and so on. I'm going to skip through that because we just heard about it. So, and then we have this fellow looking puzzled. Why does climate change have to do with disability? Well, it's becoming obvious to you now if you haven't already worked with this issue. But we find in both communities, the climate activist community and the disability community, it's not an obvious connection there. So we have a lot of issues to explore in that regard. People with disabilities face vulnerability. And we're going to talk about what that word means in this context. We face discrimination, marginalization, lack of resources and social, and social supports. And climate change creates additional stressors. People with disabilities may experience injury, death. That's certainly a health consequence. Um, fall behind in times of emergency, lose social or medical support. In the disability community and from the, from the perspective of disability studies, we look at two different models of disability, the medical model versus the social model. The medical model is centuries, millennia old. The assumption that the problem of disabled people is that our bodies are wrong. There's something bad or flawed about our actual individual physical bodies. Um, and this is what we call the medical model. <clears throat> and this implies that it's our fault, it's our problem, there's something broken, there's a lack of capacity, and as a result, we are not worthy. So the disability, and there's a history of exclusion that's centuries old, and the eugenics era in the 1880s, a new idea came, it was a distortion of Darwin's theory, of survival of the fittest, but it was latched onto by confused politicians and government officials and philosophers and others. And this idea actually made its way into public policy for the first time in centuries, and people with disabilities were legally and systematically excluded, sexually sterilized, incarcerated, and all sorts of horrible things. And it was made into law in that era. And this has persisted into, into current times. The idea is that people with disabilities and our bodies are the burden. And in many cases, even better off dead. There's a triage mentality. And the word triage comes from the battleground, where soldiers and medics have to make a decision about who to rescue based on the shape that they're still in after they've been injured from the weapons. Um, a colleague of mine named Tanya Tchaikovsky at the University of Ontario, she came up with the phrase essentially excludable. And this other person said, oh, well, you know, Tanya, we can't include everyone. And that's when Tanya created this concept that people with disabilities are in some ways in the minds of the eugenic ideology that this group of people is OK to exclude, at least, at least at this point in history. So that's something that we face still at this moment. Now, the good news is the social model evolved in the last 40, 50 years, where disability scholars and disability activists said, wait a minute. Let's change the definition of the problem. It's not the people's bodies where disability resides. It's in the environment. It's in the attitudes that have excluded us, regarded us as unworthy and as the problem, when it's the ex it's exclusive barriers in the culture, the stairs, the lack of elevators, the lack of interpreters, the lack of accommodation, where disability resides, not in the individual's bodies. <clears throat>
So the social model is amazing and incredibly important in the last decades of activism to reframe the problems and change the environment, change the attitudes, enable people with disabilities to be included on the basis of accommodations and access. The social model is an amazing idea, but it's not just a philosophy. It's not just something that's exciting and empowering that operates in our minds. The social model operates in the environment, in our infrastructures. And we've had 60 years of activism and advocacy re resulting in this more inclusive structure. But what went into that shift in our point of view in understanding what disability is? So we have to look around at where the social model is operating at a pragmatic level. Accessible housing, accessible roads, sidewalks, entrances to buildings, accessible transportation systems of all kinds. And the relationships, the social cohesion is the phrase that we're hearing now in climate change and in the disability community, where there are stable, dependable relationships with family members, with paid helpers, with our friends, with volunteers, with people who provide services. And we depend on medical care, non-emergency as well as emergency, but the regular health care that Alice was talking about earlier, durable medical equipment and so on. And we depend on social benefits, the programs, the policies that have evolved over the last decades to provide essential services like personal assistance. Um, we also need mobility across borders. And a lot of the social benefits that we depend on are located in the town, the state, the, or the, the county where we receive the services. So we have to have an address to get legitimate assistance through the social benefits programs. We need electric power for our computers and our wheelchairs, et cetera. We need communications technologies to connect with people across different um, categories of impairment. Deaf people, for example, hearing impaired people, need to have communications operating to be able to receive accommodations and so on. Alex mentioned the word vulnerability. We also talk about the, fra the, the term fragile. So what is vulnerability? What do we mean by that? It's a word that people with disabilities don't particularly like to admit that we are that vulnerable. Nobody does. We like to think of ourselves, you know, particularly in, I think, in the United States, we're independent and we have independent living centers and we like to be able to be self-determined and do things ourselves. But we are vulnerable. And in the context of climate change, we are very vulnerable. We, um, we see that the concept was developed and defined um, starting around the era of Katrina, the terrible um, impact in the <coughs> South United States where we saw horrific pictures of disabled people dead in their wheelchairs while the displaced people still living were filing by. And this photojournalism photo journalism began to document the, um, the neglect and abandonment of people with disabilities and the lack of planning. And in the um, nursing homes and residential facilities where disabled people just drowned and there had been no planning for evacuation. Um, we have, uh, we say we have good news and bad news. Many organizations, um, and I'll mention a few, have begun to recognize the need for um, planning and inclusion of people with dis disabilities in the planning. Um, a part of our research, um, Alex and I have been trained as, um, I took a course in the Community Emergency Response Training Program, CERT, where, um, it's a, and it's a lovely program where um, fire departments become the faculty to train volunteers in the community to um, respond to natural disaster and you get a hard hat and a vest and a kit and um, to be able to go out when there's a disaster of any kind in your neighborhood, in your community. Um, and it's a, it's a lovely program and I got to, to see this program in operation. But as the course evolved, I got a little concerned about the, the absence of disability mentioned in the training. In fact, the 200 page binder uh, textbook 
produced by the uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management um, Agency, disability was mentioned twice in 200 pages in ways that made me feel and realize that disability is um, regarded in a really triage mentality. Um, so, and the United Nations um, Convention on the Human Rights of People with Disabilities has really good language that can support the idea of inclusion of people with disabilities in disaster planning and in planning for um, climate change impact, but yet it has, uh, it's not yet specific enough to address the needs as we see them. Um, so, <clears throat> Again, um, now this is an interesting analogy that we, we started to see emerge between the medical model of disability and an analogous medical model of climate impact. So in the medical model of disability, we look to the physiology of the individual person as the location of the problem. In climate mitigation, as Alice, Alex was talking about, we look at the planet as the place that needs to get fixed. Science and technology is the solution to the problem. And Al Gore and others who are great to alert us to the need for, for engaging business, government, science and technology, yeah, that's important, of course. But it's not the only solution. The social model of climate impact is looking at intersectional issues, is looking at relationships, is looking at marginalization, race, class, gender, disability, and economics, and the interconnectivity and relationships and the collaboration with specific realistic grasp of our vulnerabilities. And we start now, just in the disability community, we're not waiting for the cure. We, we expect and demand to have good lives now with access and accommodation. So we want to mention some scary lessons, and I think I'll go through these quickly. Um, Alex mentioned Oroville, and Katrina, I mentioned Katrina, and the forest fires, and so on. There's a really um, important YouTube called Right to be Rescued. It's a documentary. It's just about five minutes long um, on the impact of Katrina on people with disabilities, where a, an individual told the story of her good friend who died in Katrina while she was waiting for some uh, assistance to arrive. And at this conference that we went to in Sacramento, the Get It Right conference, a lovely person came in. She, uh, she was um, linked in on the video, and she told the story of the Oroville Dam and the impact on her life. And she's not ill, but she has complex, uh, complex accommodation needs. And she went through, moment by moment, what it was like for her over the course of a couple of days um, trying to get evacuated from her home with her personal assistance and her daughter um, to get the medical assistance that she needed to function outside of her very accessible home environment. And the first responders tried very hard to think about her and, and plan for her evacuation, and they couldn't. They completely failed, not their fault, because they were trying, but the planning had not occurred to enable her evacuation, and they sent her home. Um, we notice in a lot of the disability, I mean, in the climate change literature, that people like Al Gore and Joanna Macy and all these wonderful people who were doing um, a variety of different kinds of activism around climate will tell us the horror stories of climate impact, and then toward the end of the workshop or the book say, let's remain hopeful. How do we do that? So we need to have really important conversations and soul-searching perspectives on how we maintain our energy and our motivation and hold out the hope that we need both to mitigate climate impact and to plan for adaptation and to take action for adaptation. DAILIES are this an acronym for Disability Adjusted Life Years is a public health concept that was created to be able to put a metric to the quality of life for people with disabilities. Now, from the perspective of the disability community, this is a really bizarre thing to do, to put a number on somebody's life, quality of life. But that is sort of the way researchers, and particularly those interested in metrics, tend to think. 
climate change impacts on the disability-adjusted life years. So things like storm-related injuries, malnutrition, invasive diseases, and certainly conflict and war in injuries create more disability. And that's a point that we need to keep making, although it's, it's not that motivating to people in denial, but climate change impact is going to uh, significantly increase the population of people with disabilities. We need to plan, see, these are more the things that we need to plan for. Um, communication for people with sensory disabilities, for storm warnings on television and closed captioning, key um, and announcements in shelters, um, evacuation, um, transportation and, and um, accommodations, um, and how's a recovery phase if, if we are able to begin to plan for that for housing and employment. Because of eugenic ideology, the idea that people with disabilities are a burden, um, there, there have been many documented um, circumstances over centuries, starting with immigration and policy, where people with disabilities um, struggling to, uh, with their families struggling to relocate, have faced uh, severe discrimination and abandonment. And there, we're saying difficulties in displacement and relocation with um, accessible transportation and housing and so on. Um, um, and the, the climate migration literature typically does not address the difficulties of people with disabilities. Um, conflict ref, uh, refugees with disabilities may be um, stopped at the border because of the assumptions that disabled people will be an e even greater economic burden to that um, new country. Um, so we have many organizations beginning to look at climate change um, impact. Um, we have something called the International Panel on Climate Change. Um, and again, people with disabilities are not specifically addressed. What we're noticing is that there are in the lists of vulnerable populations, the category of vulnerable includes people with special needs in a really broad assumption that those people are special, when in fact the reality of people with mobility impairments versus people with hearing impairments versus the other categories, the need for adaptation is really, really different across the individual categories as well as the individual people. So these lists of, <coughs> of um, vulnerable populations need to include really specific categories of people with disabilities. This is a nice concept of a flowchart to look at the cyclical process of analysis, education, advocacy, and implementation. And it operates cyclically where we keep revisiting these, these crucial points to um, improve and clarify our thinking and our action. So for education, we want to create publications and media. And this is where we're delighted to have organizations represented and individuals encouraging you to um, develop research and policy papers, articles, op-eds and videos, develop media strategies, contact key stakeholders, explain the issues, et cetera, et cetera, particularly seeking out environmental justice, disability, and human rights organizations. And the same with advocacy, getting a range of partners, collaboration is so essential. And in the disability community, we have a slogan, nothing about us without us, which of course means that the input of people with disabilities at every stage of planning, thinking, educating, implementing is hugely essential for accuracy in meeting our accommodation needs. What brought me here was the connection, that an important connection that's being offered at this conference 
for my first time, between climate change and disability. They are intrinsically connected, and I don't see very many people doing work on it yet, so I'm anxious to hear how it's going. We're at a period in U.S. history where our democratic way of life is at risk. Rule of law is what is terrifically important. It's what I've taught for a number of years at the university. Uh, if we can't obey our, uh, out of respect for our Constitution and our international obligations, then I think we're in a very perilous situation where red lights may not mean stop to everybody, just to certain people. Red lights are for everybody, and the rights of persons with disabilities must be spread through our, all of our communities across the country. We can't look at previous climactic and uh, geographical records to know what our next years will be as far as agriculture is concerned, as far as people's homes are concerned throughout this country, we're having loss of life and loss of property because of unexpected flooding and other climate disasters. And to the extent possible, I think the human species has to accommodate itself to what's happening and is inevitably going to be happening more often in the future. Uh, and I'm concerned because it's scary not to know that we have any assurance that we can safely plant crops, plan businesses, do negotiations with any expectation that in a week, a month, a year, everything will be as, it, as, it, as we have planned it now, rather than being swept away by climate changes that we have no control over. The thing I'm, I'm particularly concerned with, because I believe everybody has to chip in in some way, and the thing you do is grab hold of an issue within which, within which you can do some good. And I'm working uh, for the ratification in the United States of a treaty on the rights of persons with disabilities, which the U.S. has refused to ratify uh, out of 193 countries in the world and in the United Nations. Uh, over 165 of them have ratified it, and it's to our shame that the U.S. has not. Well, this workshop uh, gives me hope. In fact, uh, Alex's words tonight were quite inspiring, and I think there is an opportunity that this workshop uh, presents to broaden the conversation about disability and climate change, and to do that in such a way that involves and includes um, more people. I think that's the hope, and I think that's what was put forth tonight. I'm very grateful I was here. If I were to design a follow-up workshop to this workshop, uh, Climate Change and Disability 102 kind of concept, I would try to tie climate change into capitalism, because capitalism is the economic system that creates climate change. Um, and capitalism has been a disaster for the planet um, and is really just destroying the planet. Um, in my own activism, I, I work on two levels. I, I work on the level of the impact of climate change on the disability community, the very specific impacts on the disability community, but also um, a more global level that addresses um, climate change politically and economically. And as an animal rights activist, I, I really am very, very concerned about the impacts of climate change on animals um, and plants. I'm a botanist by degree. My, that's what my degree is in, botany. And so I'm a naturalist, and I look at what climate change is doing to this planet from that level, as well as the economic level, as well as the political level, as well as the disability level. It's all, it's all one for me.